What is your compass reading, Powers? I don't know where we are. We must have gotten lost after that last turn. MT-28, this is FT-74. What is your trouble? Uh, both my compasses are out, and I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida. We've just passed over a small island, and we have no other land in sight. Turn on your emergency ISF gear. Or do you have it on? ISF gear was off. I'm turning it on now. FT-28 to Nanhao Abel-3. One of the planes in the flight thinks if we went 270 degrees, we could hit land. FT-28, all planes in flight. Change course to 090 for one minute. God damn it, if we just fly west, we would get home. Hold it. Head west. Damn it. We are now flying 270 degrees. We will fly 270 degrees until we hit the beach or run out of gas. Hi, everyone. Hello. I am Lauren. And I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime. Unsolved mysteries. Missing people. And urban legends. Please check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived ones, our mailing list, Merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. Yeah, we also have a, a little tip jar that's on the website there. It's a little virtual tip jar, so if you want to swing by there and help out the show by dropping a tip, we'll give you a shout-out on the show. Awesome. So do we have any shout-outs this week? We don't have any shout-outs, but I do have a simple little question for you, Lauren. Okay. Is the word unfitting a lingerie joke? I think it might be. I think it might be. It was really good. I think it might be. I did chuckle a little bit. I liked it. (laughs) I think it might be. I did. So That in itself is a shout out. (laughs) Exactly. And the person will know what we're talking about. I thought it was pretty good. I'm like, that might be a clever little joke. It was pretty good. I liked it. So Why are we always talking about lingerie on this show? Uh, Because that's what I wear when we record. Oh, okay. That's right. I'm sorry. (laughs) So aside from Ken wearing lingerie, this week we are discussing... The Bermuda Triangle. Oh my God, we're kind of hitting that urban legend little thing. It's it, urban like it. legend, strange place type type episode we've got for you this week. So the Bermuda Triangle, sometimes also referred to as the Devil's Triangle or the Hoodoo Sea. Hoodoo. 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 H o o d o o, is a stretch of the Atlantic Ocean bordered by a line from Florida to the islands of Bermuda to Puerto Rico, and then back to Florida, covering about 500 square miles of ocean off the southeastern tip of Florida. That's an expensive Expedia cruise, folks. The earliest suggestion of unusual disappearances in the Bermuda area appeared in a September 17, 1950 article published in the Miami Herald by Edward Van Winkle Jones. Two years later, in 1952, George X. Sands wrote in a report in Fate magazine, noted what seemed like an unusually large number of strange accidents in the region. The term Bermuda Triangle was first used in an article written by Vincent H. Gaddis for Argosy magazine in 1964. In the article called The Deadly Bermuda Triangle, Gaddis claimed that in this strange area of the sea, a number of ships and planes had disappeared without explanation. In 1969, John Wallace Spencer wrote a book called Limbo of the Lost, specifically about the triangle, and two years later, a feature documentary on the subject called The Devil's Triangle was released. These, along with the bestseller, The Bermuda Triangle, published in 1974, permanently registered the legend of this strange stretch of ocean within popular culture. Yeah, this stretch of the world has been called mythical, mysterious, ghostly, and even an urban legend. But whatever you want to call it, the fact remains that dozens of ships and airplanes have disappeared in this triangle. Unexplained circumstances surround some of these accidents, including one in which 
The pilots of a squadron of U.S. Navy bombers became disoriented while flying over the area, and the planes were never found. No. Those were the uh, squawks you were hearing in the intro of this episode. Exactly. And there's been other boats and planes that have seemingly vanished from the area in good weather without even radio distress messages. So they're like not even trying to contact anybody. It's just gone. Gone. And many people, you know, even though it really wasn't written about until the 50s, many people even associate the 1937 disappearance of Amelia Earhart with the Bermuda Triangle. So remember, just because it wasn't in print doesn't mean that the Bermuda Triangle suspicion doesn't date back further than that. Well, the actually going as far back as we can, there's rumors that Christopher Columbus in 1492, when he came over, had some problems with his compasses and whatnot in the Bermuda Triangle area. Mm -hmm. So one of the first documented stories connected to the Triangle legend and the most famous lost ship in the region was the USS Cyclops, which disappeared in 1918. Maybe it only had one eye and couldn't see very much. The 542 foot long Cyclops was launched in 1910 and served as a collier, which is a ship that carries coal for the U.S. Navy during World War I. The vessel was on its way from Bahia, Salvador to Baltimore, Maryland, but never arrived. After it had made an unscheduled stop at Barbados on March 3rd and 4th to take additional supplies, it disappeared without a trace. No wreckage from the ship was ever found and no distress signal was received. The death of the 306 crew and passengers of the USS Cyclops remains the single largest loss of life in U.S. Navy history, not directly involving combat. That is just a scary statistic. I mean, you think about that, just gone. Gone. No explanation, no reason, and still yet to be found. Well, other boats, and we're going to get into a lot of this stuff. There's the SS Marine Sulphur Queen. Now, this is a tanker ship carrying molten sulfur. It disappeared off of the southern coast of Florida in 1963, and there was a full crew of 39 that were lost, and like the one that Lauren just spoke about, no wreckage from this tanker was ever found. The disappearance of a Douglas DST airliner. So now we've gone from sea to land or sea to air. Registered NC16002 occurred on the night of December 28, 1948, near the end of a scheduled flight from San Juan, Puerto Rico to Miami, Florida. The aircraft carried 29 passengers and three crew members. After takeoff, the aircraft did not respond to subsequent calls from San Juan. At 11.23 p.m., the Overseas Foreign Air Route Traffic Control Center at Miami heard a routine transmission from the flight wherein Robin Lindquist, the pilot, reported that they were at 8,300 feet and had an ETA of 4.03 a.m. His message placed the flight about 700 miles from Miami. Transmissions were heard sporadically throughout the night by Miami, but all were routine. Well, at 4.13... Link was reported he was 50 miles south of Miami. Now, the transmission was not heard at Miami, but oddly enough, was monitored at New Orleans. Now, this was some 600 miles away, but then it was relayed back to Miami. And the accident investigation report issued by the Civil Aeronautics Board said the pilot may have incorrectly reported his position. So I think this could have been pilot error. Well, at this time, the plane only had enough fuel for one hour and 20 minutes of flying. So that's all the time they had left, was one hour and 20 minutes based on fuel calculations. But the flight never landed in Miami. Now, it's I mean, this with this flight, it makes me wonder, if they were being picked up by New Orleans, could they have somehow ended up in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, it, it's... Like, how how are they being picked up by New Orleans and not Miami? You know, it that that's part of it, but you, you got to look at this aspect. A week later, on January 4th, 1949... Two bodies were found about 50 miles south of Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. So that could potentially put them in the Gulf. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Well, it they did later – well, actually, I'm not going to say later, but it is unknown if these bodies were connected to the missing plane. Now, since the last message from the missing DC-3 was heard not in Miami but New Orleans, if the bodies did come from the missing plane, it 
like Lauren said, it could indicate that the missing plane actually went down somewhere in the Straits of Florida between Florida and Cuba, which would put him in the Gulf. And no probable cause for the loss was determined by the official investigation, and it today still remains unsolved. Well, perhaps the most intriguing losses in the triangle was Flight 19. This is the one that we spoke about a minute ago that's in the intro. intro. So according to History.com, at 2.10 p.m. on December 5th, 1945, Five TBM Avenger torpedo bombers took off from a naval air station in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The planes, collectively known as Flight 19, were scheduled to tackle a three-hour exercise known as Navigation Problem Number 1. Their triangular flight plan called for them to head east from the Florida coast and conduct bombing runs at a place called Hens and Chicken Shoals. They would then turn north and proceed over Grand Bahama Island, before changing course a third time and flying southwest back to base. Save for one plane that only carried two men, each of the Avengers was crewed by three Navy men or Marines, most of whom had logged around 300 hours in the air. These guys were not unfamiliar with flight time. The flight's leader was Lieutenant Charles C. Taylor, an experienced pilot and veteran of several combat missions in World War II's Pacific Theater. At first, Flight 19's hop proceeded just as smoothly as the previous 18 that day. Taylor and his pilot buzzed over Hens and Chicken Shoals about 2.30 p.m. and dropped their practice bombs without incident. But shortly after the patrol turned north for the second leg of its journey, something very strange happened. For reasons that are still unclear, Taylor became convinced that his Avenger's compass was malfunctioning and that his planes had been flying in the wrong direction. The troubles only mounted after a front blew in and brought rain, gusting winds, and heavy cloud cover. Not the kind of ideal flying for, you know, planes in this area, because anybody that knows Florida weather or tropical weather, it's a different animal. Yes, it is. It definitely is. So Flight 19 became hopelessly disoriented. I don't know where we are, one of the pilots said over the radio. We must have got lost after that last turn. Lieutenant Robert F. Fox, another Navy flight instructor who was flying near the Florida coast, was the first to overhear the patrol's radio communications. He immediately informed the air station of the situation and then contacted the Avengers to ask if they needed assistance. Both my compasses are out and I'm trying to find Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Taylor said, his voice sounding anxious. I'm over land, but it's broken. I'm sure I'm in the Keys, but I don't know how far down. Taylor's claim didn't seem to make sense. He'd made his scheduled pass over Hens and Chicken Shoals in the Bahamas less than an hour earlier, and now he believed his planes were somehow drifted hundreds of miles off course and ended up over the Florida Keys? Seems like that would be odd because you have a long jump to get there. The 27-year-old had just transferred to Fort Lauderdale from Miami and many have since speculated that he may have confused some of the islands of the Bahamas for the Keys. Under normal circumstances, pilots lost in the Atlantic were supposed to point their planes toward the setting sun and fly west toward the mainland. But Taylor had become convinced that he might be over the Gulf of Mexico, hoping to locate the Florida Peninsula. He made a fateful decision to steer Flight 19 northeast, a course that would only take them even further out to sea. Some of his pilots seemed to have recognized that he was making a mistake. Damn it, one man griped over the radio. If we would just fly west, we would get home. Taylor was eventually persuaded to turn around and head west, but shortly after 6 p.m., he seemed to have canceled the order and once again changed direction. We didn't go far enough east, he said, still worried that he might be in the Gulf. We may as well just turn around and go east again. Remember, he is thinking that he's over the Keys. So he doesn't want to go west because he knows that going west puts him into the Gulf. And if he kept going west, he would end up in Mexico. Exactly. So he wants to make sure that he heads far enough east to get out of the Gulf so they can pick up. Because remember, he's seen the Keys. Over Florida. Which makes total sense. If he were in the Gulf. Exactly. But keep in mind, his compass was acting sporadically at this point, so west and east could have been confusing to him. His pilots 
probably argued against this decision. Some sure. investigators even believe that one plane broke off and flew in a different direction, but most followed their commander's lead. I can't believe that because there's no word or sign of that particular flight either. Right. Flight 19's radio transmission soon became increasingly faint as it meandered out to sea. So this is the, – they're, they're going east – but they're going out into the Atlantic. They're going away from Florida. It, se- it seems at this point. When fuel began to run low, Taylor was heard prepping his men for a potential crash landing in the ocean. All planes, close up tight. We'll have to ditch unless landfall. When the first plane drops below 10 gallons, we'll all go down together. A few minutes later, the Avengers' last radio communications were replaced by an eerie buzz of static. The Navy immediately scrambled search planes to hunt for the missing patrol. So around 7.30 p.m., a pair of PBM Marine flying boats took off from an air station north of Fort Lauderdale. And just 20 minutes later, however, one of them seemed to follow Flight 19's lead by suddenly vanishing off the radar. So it's basically in the same flight pattern as the same issue that Flight 19 was having. And at first light the next day, the Navy dispatched more than 300 boats and aircraft to look for Flight 19 and the missing Mariner. Now, the search party spent five days combing through more than 300,000 miles of territory to no avail. Can you imagine the effort involved? Yeah. In covering 300,000 square miles in five days. That is amazing. I mean, that that's putting in some effort, and it's literally sleepless time right now. I mean, these guys are doing everything they can to find these, these pilots. Right. They just vanished, Navy Lieutenant David White later recalled. We had hundreds of planes out looking, and we searched over land and water for days, and nobody ever found the bodies or any debris. Or any debris. That's the key factor there. Something in those planes floats. I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. Now, a Navy Board of Investigation was also left scratching its head while it argued that Taylor might have confused the Bahamas for the Florida Keys after his compass malfunctioned. It could find no clear explanation for why Flight 19 had become so disoriented. It's like, what's going on? Why were they so out of whack? These were skilled pilots. They were guys that know how to fly planes and they're good with directions. I mean, 300 hours, they can sit behind the wheel, so to speak, of a plane and fly it just fine. Now, all 14 airmen on Flight 19 were lost, as were all 13 crew members of the Martin PBM or Mariner flying boat that subsequently launched from the old air station Banana River to search for Flight 19, as we mentioned earlier. Its members eventually attributed the loss to, quote, causes or reasons unknown, end quote. (sighs) So we are far from finished telling you about all of the different air and ship accidents in the Triangle, but let's take a quick break. Be right back. And we are back. Back, 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 back. So the sail training ship HMS Atalanta, originally named HMS Juno. That's Her Majesty's ship. That's Her Majesty's ship, disappeared with her entire crew after setting sail from the Royal Navy Dockyard, Bermuda, for Falmouth, England, on January 31st, 1880. The report of the investigating committee on the loss of the British training ship, Atalanta, was published on December 29th of 1880 and stated no reliable trace had been found. Now, the committee said they considered the Atalanta a very stable ship, except at the large angles of the heel, and that the alterations in her rig only tended to increase her safety. The committee spoke favorably of her officers and crew and pointed out that at the time of her loss, exceptional storms proved fatal to a number of merchant vessels. The only exception was that survivors or debris in other cases were always found. That's what we spoke about about the airplanes. Right. Something would float. Well, according to nationalparks.org, when the Carol A. Deering, a five-masted schooner built in 1919, was found hard aground and abandoned at Diamond Shoals near Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, the crew vanished and was discovered in 1921, speculation ran wild. That speculation continues to this day, and no satisfactory explanation for the crew's disappearance has ever been proven. So we're going to rewind here. 
The Deering left Rio de Janeiro on December 2nd, 1920 and stopped for supplies in Barbados. On January 9th, 1921, the Deering left Barbados, setting sail for Hampton Roads. The ship was next sighted by the Cape Lookout Lightship off North Carolina on January 28th, 1921, when the Deering hailed it. The lightship's keeper, no, this is a lighthouse, lightship lighthouse, The lighthouse keeper, Captain Jacobson, reported that a tall, thin man with reddish hair and a foreign accent, speaking through a megaphone, told him the vessel had lost its anchors in a storm off Cape Fear and asked that the ship's owner, the G.G. Deering Company, be notified. Jacobson took note of this, but his radio was out, so he was unable to report it. He also noticed that the crew seemed to be milling around on the quarter deck of the ship, an area where they were usually not allowed to be. Yeah, which would he would be he would know that because that's sort of his profession. He's involved in watching ships come in and out all the time. Right. So by the time the wreckage was found, the crew had vanished like ghosts. Gone with them were personal belongings, key navigational equipment, some papers, and the ship's anchors. Despite an exhaustive investigation by the FBI, No trace of the crew or the ship's logs have ever been uncovered. FBI investigation into the Deering scrutinized, then ruled out multiple theories as to why and how the ship was abandoned, including piracy, domestic communist sabotage, and the involvement of rum runners. Well, you got to stop and think if the lighthouse, the guy in the lighthouse noticed or said that he, the guy was screaming, Hey, we lost our anchors in the storm and the boats found without anchors. It almost solidifies that what he said could have been somewhat factual. Right. That's just adding. We don't, more. we don't think that the lighthouse keeper's lying. Well, no, but I'm saying he's like, okay, this has got to be the boat that I saw because but the guy said there was no anchors. You understand what I'm saying? And the guy said to contact the, gg deering company and notify them so that's what i'm saying so that I mean that gives you that timeline and all of a sudden this happens and the crew is missing and it's that's what makes this so mysterious so we'll move on to some other stuff here so on december 22nd of 1967 a cabin cruiser named witchcraft left miami with her captain dan burick and his friend father patrick horgan Now, these two gentlemen's journey on the 23-foot luxury yacht was to enjoy the wonderful view of Miami's Christmas lights, which I got to tell you, if you've ever been on the water and went out to enjoy Christmas lights, it's absolutely beautiful. However, these two gentlemen, after reaching just one mile from offshore, the Coast Guard received a call from the captain stating that his ship had hit something, but there was no substantial damage. Indicating help to be towed to the shore... The Coast Guard set off immediately reaching Witchcraft in as many as 19 minutes, alone but to nothing. Now, the area indicating the ship's location was completely deserted, with no signs of any ship having been stranded or even present there previously. So So it was just gone. Gone. There's nothing. What's most intriguing about this story is that this particular cruiser was virtually unsinkable, not to mention numerous life-saving devices present aboard, including life jackets, lifeboats, flares, distress signals, etc. Um, all these devices and stuff that they had for safety, and the boat's not there? I mean, what's going on? None of them were used. None of the the stuff was used. Exactly, and the ship was gone. And the Coast Guard officials searched hundreds of square miles of the ocean over the next few days, but were unsuccessful. Nothing of the ship was ever found. So they reached the point at where the witchcraft should have been, but it hadn't been. It wasn't there. So it they was hit something, but there was no damage. But somehow they needed to be towed. Exactly. Maybe they got eaten by a sea monster. I'm not saying it was aliens. <laughs> Could have been aliens. All right, let's move on. We're going to talk about the star tiger and the star aerial. Oh, so we're going to go astronomical? Star Tiger was an Avro Tudor 4 passenger aircraft owned and operated by British South American Airways. The plane disappeared without a trace over the Atlantic Ocean while on a flight between Santa Maria in the Azores and Bermuda in the early morning of January 30th, 1948. 
Star Tiger was one of three enlarged and improved versions of the Avro two-door designated two-door four. It had made 11 transatlantic flights, a total of 575 hours of flying time since its initial test flight on November 4th, 1947. The plane took off from Lisbon, Portugal on January 28th, 1948 and made what was supposed to be a 75 minute stop in Santa Maria in the Azores for fuel. However, the reported weather was so poor that Captain Brian W. McMillan decided they should stop over until the next day. The following day, January 29th, Star Tiger took off at 3.34 p.m. for the next leg of its flight to Bermuda, despite strong winds. McMillan had decided to fly at no more than 2,000 feet to avoid the worst of the winds. An Avro Lancaster, belonging to BSAA, piloted by Frank Griffin, took off an hour ahead of the Star Tiger, and Griffin had agreed to radio weather information back to the Star Tiger. So he's got a little help. Yes. At first, some 200 miles behind the Lancastrian, Captain McMillan slowly closed the distance between them, and both aircraft remained in radio contact with each other and Bermuda. At 3.04 p.m., after almost 12 hours in the air, Radio Officer Robert Tuck aboard Star Tiger requested a radio bearing from Bermuda, but the signal was not strong enough to obtain an accurate reading. Tuck repeated the request 11 minutes later, and this time the Bermuda radio operator was able to obtain a bearing of 72 degrees, accurate within 2 degrees. The Bermuda operator transmitted this information, and Tuck acknowledged receipt at 317. So that's going to be the last gig here. I mean, there's confirmation, if you will. That was the last communication with the aircraft. Of the passengers, 16 were British, two were Mexican, two were Czech, and one was Swiss, and four were stateless. Seven were bound for Bermuda, 12 were bound for Kingston, Jamaica, and six were bound for Havana, Cuba. On January 30th, 1948, a press dispatch reported the plane's loss at 440 miles northeast of Bermuda, 31 souls on board. So Star Ariel was an Avro Tudor Mark 4B passenger aircraft owned and operated by British South American Airways. This plane disappeared without a trace over the Atlantic Ocean while on a flight between Bermuda and Kingston, Jamaica on January 17th, 1949. This is like a year later. Yes. Star Ariel took off at 8.41 a.m., from Bermuda with seven crew and 13 passengers. Weather conditions were excellent, and the pilot, Captain John Clutha McPhee, decided on a high-altitude flight to take advantage of it. About an hour into the flight, McPhee contacted Kingston by radio. I departed from Kenley Field at 8.41 a.m. hours, my ETA at Kingston's 2.10 p.m. hours, I am flying in good visibility at 18,000 feet. I flew over 150 miles south of Kenley Field at 9.32 hours. My ETA at 30 degrees north is 9.37 hours. Will you accept control? And then at 9.42. I was over 30 degrees north at 9.37. I am changing frequency to MRX. No more messages were received from Star Ariel and Kingston finally reported her overdue. Both the Star Tiger and the Star Ariel disappearances remain unsolved to this day, with the resulting speculation helping to develop the Bermuda Triangle legend. Well, it makes sense, though. I know. I mean, you can. Here's the. Here's what gets me about the Bermuda Triangle. It's like there's so much that it you can't just overlook it. I know. I mean, it. It, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, here. Uh, you know, and, and if you look most recently, a 29 foot blue and white Mako Cuddy cabin vessel with 20 people on board was last seen publicly during departure on December 28th of 2020. The boat was reported missing a day after it was scheduled to arrive in Lake Worth, crossing the Gulf Stream from the Bahamas. So the search involving planes and boats lasted 84 hours and covered an area of 17,000 square miles. It's about twice the size of the state of Massachusetts. 
So we're talking about a lot of coverage here right? over the course of 84 hours. Now, the search did not turn up any trace of the boat or its passengers. There was no record of any kind of distress signal. So there was no distress signal, which means it literally took off and that was it. The Coast Guard did not release the name of the boat or identity of the passengers, although it said the boat was a blue and white Mako 29 Cuddy Cabin. So we're not talking about anything that has just been happening in the 40s and the 50s. This no, goes back to, this is still happening exactly, now. Exactly. That's what makes this like – it blows you away. It just – when something is happening all the time, you have to you have to look at it in a different light other than just, oh, yeah, well, the, every now and then some weird stuff happens. No, it happens pretty often. Well, these incidents that we have just discussed are just like a fraction of the hundreds – of disappearances and strange happenings associated with the triangle. Let's take a quick break and then we can discuss the possible causes of this phenomenon. Okay, so the Bermuda Triangle's reputation has been chalked up to everything from intergalactic portals and time vortexes to paranormal phenomena even to the city of Atlantis. The lost city of Atlantis? Yes. Okay. And so- I honestly only thought that the time vortex has only existed in Vegas. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> well, the theory we're going to go over first is actually the presence of the lost city of Atlantis somewhere down in the deep below the triangle. Now, the lost city of Atlantis, first mentioned by the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, more than 2,300 years ago, is known as one of the oldest and greatest mysteries of the world. According to Plato, the utopian island kingdom existed some 9,000 years before his time and mysteriously disappeared one day. Just like things in the Bermuda Triangle. Another theory is the island was believed to have housed technology far superior to what we use today, but sunk to the bottom of the ocean after a tremendous earthquake. Either way, supposedly Atlantis was home to an enormous crystal pyramid that now rests on the ocean floor. Theories suggest that somehow their use of, their use of crystal energies is the reason for the Bermuda Triangle's mystical anomalies. If all these years later, Atlantis is meant to have existed a million to 900,000 years ago, their crystals still function on the sea floor. This could be causing mechanical malfunctions in the ships and planes above. Now, side note real quick. Stories also claim that the original inhabitants of the lost city of Atlantis are believed to be of an extraterrestrial origin who reached there about 50,000 years ago from Larian, the Larian star system. Okay. Don't know what that is, but despite being much taller and fairer than today's average human being, the average lifespan of these people is believed to have been 800 years, making them really robust and strong prototype of the existent human race. It's all, yeah, 800 years unless your city falls in the ocean. A convincing theory, assuming you believe in Atlantis, in spite of the fact that the lost city has never been proven to exist... It's actually most likely that the city of Atlantis never even existed and was simply a work of fiction written in two of Plato's fables, Timaeus and Critias. Oh, so publicity. A publicity stunt. <laughs> Plato, <laughs> if Plato knew what publicity stunts were back in ancient Greece, then maybe that's what it was. He was just advertising for his book. I'm sure of it. <laughs> well, Lauren, next up we have to talk about magnetic forces, which yeah, I'm going to kind of lean more towards. Confusing as they may be to read, the primary function of a compass is to point north, okay? So regardless, they're, 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 they can be weird. Some people have a hard time with compasses, especially people with iPhones now because the compass is on the phone. And it's really a weird scenario for it to be on the phone. It's a great thing, but – They didn't have those back when they were flying in the Flight 19. Now, it is important to note that the Bermuda Triangle is one of the two places on Earth where a compass will point to true north 
instead of magnetic north. This means that your compass will only ever point towards the geographical north pole. Now, theorists believe this explains how so many ships and planes have disappeared. Like Lauren mentioned earlier, Christopher Columbus even wrote about a bizarre compass bearings in this particular area of the Bermuda Triangle. This was reported by the National Geographic. The seas reportedly lie above an imaginary agonic line where true north and magnetic north are in perfect alignment. The magnetic north pole is constantly shifting and sits 1,200 miles south from the stationary geographic north pole. Now, Natural Resources Canada explained over much of the Earth's surface, compass needles point roughly north. However, because of the complex shape of the Earth's magnetic field, there are a few places where a compass needle will point exactly north. A compass lines up with the horizontal component of the magnetic field in a direction called magnetic north. True north, on the other hand, is the direction from a given location to the north geographical pole. So there's two norths. There's there's the magnetic north, and then there's the true geographic north. Exactly. Well, the difference between these two is called magnetic inclination. So it's it's going to be a little bit off, and it has a lot to do with how everything lines up. Because remember, when you look at the Earth, the Earth doesn't sit exactly north and south when it's on its axis. Right. It's tilted. Yes. So technically speaking, that's going to be the difference between the North Pole, which you're going to be exactly far north, true north, and magnetic north, which is going to be sort of at a slight angle, which is roughly 500 kilometers or 1,200 miles off. So that's where the difference is, and I think that that's where this theory lies in place. I mean, their evidence suggests lost boats and planes are due to human error not taking into the account that this could possibly create a false reading on the compass. You know, so a lot of it has to do with maybe the magnetic forces weren't right with the compasses, which, of course, could, you know, basically throw off the bearings. The one thing that I have a problem with in this theory, which it's a great theory and it's probably the most scientific theory, is they vanished. And by the term vanished means no evidence of loss. Right. Okay. So... Let's talk about rogue waves for a second. These, this gives me nightmares, just the idea of these rogue waves. So rogue waves are unusually large, up to a hundred feet, unpredictable and suddenly appearing surface waves that can be extremely dangerous to ships, even large ships. Rogue waves are an open water phenomenon in which winds, currents, and other circumstances cause a wave to briefly form that is far larger than the average large wave of that time and place. These monster waves can maybe account for the ships that have disappeared, but they can't account for the planes. I mean, they're not that tall. So researchers argue that some waves could reach up to 100 feet in height, like I said, but they would still be too far too small to reach planes that typically fly between 31,000, 38,000 feet in the air. Are you sure? I mean, that just seems like a – I mean, 100 feet just seems like a a small wave compared to a 31,000 foot one. (laughs) I mean, imagine that crashing on the beach. I mean, how far that – I mean, that would be a tsunami though. What would your – In reality, that would be a tsunami if it – Crashed into land. Not uh, that's even uh, tsunami. You'd have to call that like a, I don't know, a phenomenal tsunami at this point to reach that kind of elevation. I don't know. Imagine just so, being like floating out on your boat, and here comes this hundred foot wave. Just like that's like certain death. Yeah. Well, <laughs> exactly. Well, I like the rogue wave theory, but again, it doesn't explain for why the airplanes went missing and things. So, Lauren, I'm gonna go ahead and just throw it out there. Aliens. Aliens. Now, some people subscribe to the theory that, you know, the Bermuda Triangle acts as sort of this portal um, to our planet for aliens to gather uh, the people and technology they need to research our species. So this is like a portal where they can come in and snatch people up and take them somewhere else and do what they do where they probe you or whatever it is. So now this might explain why some of the ships and planes have never been discovered, you know, because – the aliens took them. I mean, we're not saying it was aliens. But it was aliens. 
All right. <laughs> okay. I just had to put aliens out there, Lauren. I mean, think about it. <laughs> like, okay. It's it's a theory. All right. If we're going to talk about aliens, we have to talk about wormholes. See, now wormholes, you're, you're talking my language because now we're getting to some other theories that I really like. So some think that the Bermuda Triangle is a portal through space and time. Thanks to a report from Bruce Jernon, a pilot who claimed to have leapt 100 miles after a fog surrounded his aircraft, wormholes through time and space are now a plausible explanation. He said, I didn't believe in time travel or teleportation until it happened to me. Now, I just want everyone to know that I have found Mr. Jernon on social media and have attempted to reach out to him. I am still awaiting his reply. He's in a wormhole. He'll Maybe. return shortly. Maybe. <laughs> All right, so – okay, so we've talked about aliens, wormholes. There's a lot of theories out there, so let's talk about methane bubbles. Like big farts. <laughs> Not exactly, Lauren, but okay. Nah. No. They no, will no, fart. No, 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 no. Sea no. alien no. farts. No, 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 no. no. Not sea alien farts. Not Mr. Drenon farts. So researchers at the Arctic University of Norway have just discovered huge underwater craters off the coast of Norway. They consider – Probably a cause of enormous blowouts of gas. So I guess in that sense, big farts. Depending on what the Earth ate that day, whether it be a plane or a <laughs> ship, you're going to get this new. <laughs> Sorry, I had to, Lauren. I couldn't help myself. We're talking about methane bubbles and ships getting lost, so it's possible they ate, got eaten. No, <laughs> in all seriousness, Lauren. In, in all seriousness, Lauren, here, Lauren. Ships certainly could sink suddenly if the water beneath them turned to foam which these craters measuring up to 45 meters deep and 800 meters wide could possibly be capable of doing. But these gas craters were found off the coast of Norway, not in the Bermuda Triangle. But that didn't stop the conspiracy theorists from claiming that, you know, the mystery had been solved. Hey, we've solved this mystery. Nope. Even if there were these methane bubbles in the triangle, it still does not explain the missing planes. And just a little side note, if there's – if the gas turns to foam, it's usually a bad sign. Yeah. Okay. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. When farts turn to foam, it's a problem. Okay. <laughs> I've never had a fart turn to foam, but. You never heard that joke? If no. you're sliding into home and you feel something foam diary. Okay. Um, moving on. Human Edit error. point. <laughs> <laughs> Human error. Oh, my God. Hold on. <laughs> All this fart talk is like I'm sorry, I Lauren, I had to do it. I mean, we were we, that was a that was a it was a reference, a movie reference, I'm sorry. Human error, bad weather and the fact that it's so busy. The Bermuda Triangle is actually a very busy area of the sea. Now, I'm going to butcher this, but Carl Kruselnicki an Australian scientist believes that a huge number of disappearances can be explained by nothing more supernatural than human error, bad weather, and the fact that it's so busy with planes and boats. He said, It is close to the equator, near a wealthy part of the world, America. Therefore, you have a lot of traffic. According to Lloyds of London and the U.S. Coast Guard, the number that go missing in the Bermuda Triangle is the same as anywhere in the world on a percentage basis. Well, one problem I have with that, Lauren, is in when Flight 19 disappeared, it was not busy. We're well, talking about the 40s. So, I mean, it yeah. wasn't a busy place. So, that's my only issue with that. I do agree with some of the human error and possibly bad weather. But in some issues, if you remember, we talked about- Where is the wreckage? They had beautiful weather. Yes. And again, again, where is the wreckage? So- the most likely reason, sorry to disappoint our conspiracy theorists listening, is that the Bermuda Triangle is a vile vortex. According to an article on marineinsight.com, the Bermuda Triangle is one of the 12 vile vortices that are present on the Earth's surface. Now, vile vortices are places where the Earth's magnetic pull is quite high and interferes with the modern scientific equipment like compass and gyroscopes, kind of what we mentioned earlier. And the main reason that the Bermuda Triangle gets so much allure and intrigue than the remaining 11 vile vortices is because the various incidents and mishaps that have occurred in its path. We just discussed several of them in this episode, and there's hundreds 
beyond that. Right. Now, as science and technology have developed and the mystery of the vile vortices have been discovered in today's times, it has been proved that the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle is not because of any any extraterrestrials or UFOs or due to any other mysterious objects. The fact that there is a very high pull of the Earth's natural magnet, which redirects the compass and other sophisticated equipment and disallows them to take their intended route through the waters is the main reason behind the bizarre occurrences of the triangle. Then any other reason. So I just, Lauren, this whole, the, you can use whatever theory you want. I like the aliens. I think it was aliens. I did find a lot of things that I found really interesting in researching this. So if you really haven't looked into the Buna Triangle, I think you really should look it up. Yeah, it's actually kind of scary when you really start digging into it. I mean, I only cherry picked like some of the bigger, more well-known disappearances when I was putting this episode together. But there is so many. Exactly. Well, one thing to keep in mind, too, and the one thing that I love so much about mysterious places or uh, when you get into urban legends is some of these people really come up with some really – convincing theories yeah so if you look at the research they can almost convince you pretty well hey this is what's happening you're like oh my god that's a possibility and you realize this guy is talking about aliens it was aliens so it was aliens but uh you know when it comes to uh mysterious places i think the Bermuda triangle might be one of the most mysterious and sort of sought after places in the world to kind of look at when you know it's kind of a go-to yeah. You know, it's kind of like Loch Ness. It's like, we know it's there. We know it exists. We can't explain it. But wait, did it even exist at all? We don't know. Right. There's no evidence. Right. Did these planes really disappear? Did they land? I mean, who knows? You know, when what's I was younger, I thought that the Bermuda Triangle was going to be a much bigger issue for me than it really is. I was just worried about quicksand. Yeah, that too. And I thought the Loch Ness monster was going to be like a big deal, but it wasn't. I thought the Loch Ness pond. I thought and, Loch and Ness was in every pond. Was never made of lava. My floor was made of lava. <laughs> when I was a kid, it was lava. The floor was lava. No, I'm kidding. So. All right, everyone. All right. Well, that was a lot of fun, Lauren. I really enjoy every now and then. Again, like I think I've said it before, we get these breaks where we do a urban legend or a mysterious place. You Something know. other than a murder or a disappeared person. That's what I love about our format and what we do here at Paradise After Dark. So. Not that we don't like doing the, the other cases, but sometimes we need a little, a little mental, bit of mental health break. break. <laughs> exactly. So um, is there anything else you want to add, Lauren? No, I All think right. we're, I think we're good. I would love to hear if anybody has any other theories, uh, please hook us up yeah I'm, I'm i'm social media email us let us know what your thoughts are yeah the beauty of it is is something like this now now that the door has been opened into the bermuda triangle looking into this case or into this whatever you want to call this thing that we're doing this mysterious place i'm gonna keep looking because okay. i really i really want to find more out even though you know ken's I, gonna start his whole a whole new podcast about the bermuda triangle don't tip me because i'll do it <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, all right, everybody. That's it for tonight. Again, if you'd like to support our show, please consider subscribing to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. And be sure, like Lauren mentioned earlier, check out our website for links to all of our social media, our Patreon, our merch store, mailing list, all kinds of goodies there. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review us. This really, 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 really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. It really does, folks. And we we, we really want to thank you very much for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.